Television. Joining us now from New York is Dr. Kanta Ahmad, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations in the United States, an associate professor of medicine at the State University of New York. Welcome, Dr. Ahmad. Hi, uh, Yumna. Good, good having you here. Great to be here. I, I want to get right into it. You've recently written, as a Muslim, and I quote, a naturalized American, I believe this is a bold geopolitical decision. In the age of Islamism, these bans are pragmatic and presidential. And I wanted to ask you, now that a federal judge blocked the ban on travelers, what does it say about the current political situation within the United States? Great question. I think since the election of Donald Trump, and you and I spoke about it right on the threshold of his election, the country seems to have lost objectivity. Their passions are so high in the United States that people cannot recognize a pragmatic move when they see one. If you just think of one or two countries in the seven listed, Iran is in a separate category. But if we think about Libya or Somalia, Libya is ungoverned. The, the authorities are, are fighting amongst each other. There really is no control outside of Tripoli. All of southern, Lib si southern Libya is open to migrants coming from Africa. 300,000 migrants are waiting to enter Europe from the Libyan coast. 180,000 have crossed the Mediterranean alone. Uh, migrants coming from the African continent number 500,000 in Italy over the last three years. So the scale of the problem is astonishing in terms of migrants just from one area. Somalia is another. The Somalian authorities cannot govern outside of Mogadishu. Their own government cannot travel let alone govern the rest of the region. So we're dealing with areas where there is collapsing authority. Iraq and Syria, you know all too well. But what's fascinating is these countries all were placed under immigration restriction by President Obama in December 2015, and there wasn't an outcry. Even more, I'm particularly aghast at the plight of Syrian refugees over the last six years. As you know, Lebanon, your country, has hosted millions of Syrian refugees with great compassion in camps inside Lebanon. Jordan has done the same. Turkey has taken an enormous number. But the United States has been less than forthcoming for the last six years. Now that President Trump has announced that there's going to be an indefinite pause, the yeah, United he States... suspended all refugee admissions indefinitely. Yeah, all, but Syrians in particular, the, ba the uh, so-called ban is a three-month pause, but on Syria, he's mentioned indefinite. That's why he's moving for no-fly zones. I, I just, there, were, there, were, there were no protests. There was no outrage in the United States for the last six years. So this climate is a reaction to President Trump. I, I want to ask you, I want to get to, because I know you mentioned Lebanon and you mentioned our former education minister uh, recently, and I'll get to that in a moment, but what do you say to people who say that according to an analysis of data by the Cato Institute, there have been zero fatal terror attacks on U.S. soil since 1975 by any immigrants from the seven Muslim-majority countries. So when right, people, I, I, and zero I, Americans I, have been killed I, by any Syrian I, refugee in a terrorist attack on the U.S. soil. I've seen that report. I, I, I've seen that report. I agree with you. But I've also um, either lived or traveled here in the United States for the last 15 years post 9-11. I work directly in my own practice with uh, law enforcement and counterterrorism. The United States has an incredible domestic and border counterterrorism uh, force, which has, of course, thwarted many such episodes. And the vast majority, the vast bulk of migrants, whether they are economic migrants or whether they are refugees, are innocent people, not only Muslims, but also Christian families and other, other religions. They don't mean any harm to the United States. But ISIS has made a declaration and has uh, uh, made an intention to capitalize on human migrant streams. So that, there is no question that the risk is posed. And I think the United States is using its judgment based on the experience that we have in Europe. Of course, Many of the attacks that have happened in France, Brussels, and so forth have been from citizens, but have also been orchestrated by migrant travelers where borders just cannot be contained. Right, so, so I, I think, think he's basing it on that. But Dr. Ahmad, you yourself, as a Muslim woman living in the United States today... And, Let yeah. me just add that I yeah. think one of the reasons I'm, I'm, I'm glad that this ban has come to pass 
is now Americans like me and fellow Americans are going to have enormous pressure to hold over the U.S. president to support in humanitarian fashion and military and diplomatic fashion the plight of the Syrian refugees. In the first week of President Trump, Trump's presidency, he had phone calls with the king of Saudi Arabia, with um, uh, other leaders in the Muslim world, to cut, uh, with, of course, uh, Russia's Putin, to come up with a defendable no-fly zone, which should have been done years ago, which would have not destabilized Europe and would not pose this crisis now. It's interesting you mentioned Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia, critics have argued, should have been perhaps on the list because a lot of terrorists, including some in the 9-11, were known to be Saudi. There's been a debate over it. There's been a bill that President Obama uh, halted. There's been, a, there's been, you know, a lot of talk about Saudi Arabia specifically, and there's been no mention of that. So I guess what people are asking is, you know, why this, what seems to be arbitrary uh, decision-making, arbitrary choosing, Right, I understand, Yumna, so I'm not making my point clear. Remember, I've lived in Saudi Arabia for two years, and I also have traveled to the Saudi Kingdom for almost 10 years in, in, as part of my work, so I know the country well. And the same argument could be made for Pakistan, from where and I Afghanistan. am. Afghanistan. And Afghanistan, of course. The countries are not chosen arbitrarily. If you look at Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, they, have, uh, they actually govern with in incredible power. The Pakistani military is a formidable force. As you know, they have just uh, um, uh, launched last year an incredible operation on the north, northwest frontier where they dislocated the resident population in, the, in order to go after the extremists. With Saudi Arabia, this is the argument that n people, many people are using, including the same uh, liberal voices that are condemning Trump's Muslim ban, are asking us to ban one of the most important Muslim countries in the world. So it's sort of hypocritical. I understand Saudi Arabia. It has a responsibility because it has, has definitely propagated radical Islam ideology in mosques and in mullahs. But at the same time, there is another Saudi Arabia which is busy combating this, containing it, providing us vital information. There are other factors at play. First of all, Saudi Arabia, of course, is critical in the world petroleum market. Secondly, Saudi Arabia and um, uh, Gulf Arab countries are completely committed to defeating ISIS, which matches U.S. national security interests. And it also matches interests with the state of Israel. And I believe that this common enemy is going to bring together the potential for not only a peace process in Syria, but stabilization of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Those prizes are so uh, valuable that they would not risk them with a universal um, immigrant ban. And well, another thing, I, in, I, am, I am a Muslim American, but did you know the vast majority of Muslims in America are immigrants and the highest percentage actually comes from Pakistan? 14% of us are, in Pakist are of Pakistani origin. So I don't think it's arbitrary. I think it's about the destabilization from the right, Levant. but when, you no. know, and this is, this is one of my last questions for you. You know, when the Trump administration says it wants to revamp and rename the U.S. government program designed to counter all violent ideologies, I'm talking here about countering violent extremism, or yes. CVE, and he wants to rename it to become countering Islamic extremism, which means right. it will no longer target groups such as white supremacists. Now, when well, you hear that, which are, you know, how do you respond to that? It's just going to focus on that. I so, think, I think long overdue, Yumna. This is something that President Obama evaded for the last two presidencies. So that thinkers like myself, those of us that understand radical Islam, had almost no voice. It was sanitized into countering violent extremism. And, of course, we have the Ku Klux Klan here. Klan here. We do have some white nationalists. But they are not devastating and destabilizing vast areas of the Middle East, lots of Europe. They're not threatening the United States. That is not the number one priority. And I think it's, re it's refreshing. In Saudi Arabia, they do not worry about nationalism. They worry about jihadism. The same in Pakistan. We're no different. All right. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. That was Dr. Kanta Ahmad joining us from New York, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations in the United States. Thank you, doctor.